Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Alexander Blevins. He recently retired from a career in healthcare. He now enjoys stitching words together into stories. In fact, he just released his first novel called Bycatch, and he's working on a second novel, interestingly enough, that is um, being framed as a prequel to Grapes of Wrath, which sounds really interesting. Now, he also enjoys hiking, fly fishing, woodworking, and driving a hand-me-down BMW. Another interesting fact about him, he and his wife, Marcia, split their time between the Mississippi Gulf Coast and some town in Louisiana whose name I cannot pronounce, but he's originally from Carmel, California. He's very eclectic in the places he's lived and the things uh, that he's interested in. He spent time in the military. Uh, his debut novel, again, is titled Bycatch. It, it launched uh, this year, earlier this year, it was uh, made available. Uh, Alex Blevins, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. You bet. Now, tell me about this hand-me-down BMW. <laughs> well, it, uh, it had belonged to my father, and when he passed on, uh, my, my sister got the jewelry, and I got a, an old... BMW, so <laughs> that's how we split things up. That's, that's been nothing, nothing but a, a maintenance nightmare. But uh, it's nostalgic. It's fun to drive, and and um, uh, it's it's not a highway car, but it gets around town. <laughs> so you had this career in healthcare. Now you you are you were a surgeon, is that right? Yes, I was an orthopedic surgeon, and actually specialized in hand surgery, and uh, had, had done that for many years, and. Um, why hand uh, surgery? Enjoy. I mean, uh, what? Tell me about, um, y you know, why a hand surgeon rather than general surgeon? What is the primary um, type of injury or or ailment that you deal with when it comes to hands? Well, I did a residency in uh, orthopedic surgery, so I was I was a board certified orthopedic surgeon. Then I did, I did a, another year in hand surgery specifically. Um, and a fellowship, and so then I, that's what I specialize in. But hand surgery, um, it, it's, it's very, um, it's a very intricate, uh, you get to sit down while you're doing surgery, um, which is a plus, I think. And, um, yeah, I got to, to take care of a, a number of different types of patients. Uh, I would do several cases, you know, on an operating day and, and rarely do the same case twice. Um, so uh, I did everything from trauma, a lot of trauma, um, and reconstructive surgery, such, such as arthritis, uh, nerve surgery, such as carpal tunnel syndrome and things like that. So I operated pr primarily from the elbow down, bones, nerves, arteries, things of that nature. So a lot of authors who have carpal tunnel syndrome because they're typing away at the keyboard relentlessly and you had to patch them together, um, <laughs> perhaps. Um, so when you were a surgeon, you were scribbling out indecipherable prescriptions for your patients, and then you decided, I'm going to start writing something that's readable, and um, you wrote your first novel. But how long did you have being a writer in mind while you were a surgeon? I mean, did, does this date back to your, to, to your early years, or was it something more recent? No, I think, I think the evolution was is that I... I enjoyed storytelling first, and I've always been a, a storyteller. In fact, my older sister used to say I could retell a two-hour movie in four hours. And um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think I think my my writing comes from storytelling. Um, when I was getting close to retiring from my practice, I was obviously looking for other things to do to occupy my time. I had a, I have a lot of hobbies, and and uh, I enjoy traveling, but. Um, I, I, I think I, I wanted to become a better writer, and uh, so I started working at the craft, and that was probably about six years or so ago. Maybe four years ago, I started on this book, Bycatch. 
Now you said become a better writer. What was what did more for you to make you a better writer than anything? Is there any technique? Is there any training? Is there any exercise? Any class or book you read? Anything like that? I think the the one thing that helped me become a better writer was to write for other people, and um, I I started a blog and uh, and started recording travel blog you know activities and stuff like that and and just in doing that knowing that somebody else was going to read what i wrote made me concentrate on, on what i was doing so i think that was it that was probably the most important thing was was dedicating whatever i was going to write to to being read by somebody else somebody so i was publishing it myself i don't know how many people actually read that stuff but uh, at least in my mind i thought i was i was being read and so i i I paid attention. And, and as a surgeon, I was very attentive to detail. So that came easily to me. Um, and uh, but as far as formal training, I, I don't think that I had. I, I guess I kind of consider myself a um, <clears throat> folk artist of, of in writing. <laughs> now, um, I have to ask you this this uh, key question. When you would write your blog, and you were writing for other people, but did you have a specific person in mind, a singular person, whether it be your wife, Marsha, or a friend, or, or some other a coworker, or were you writing just with the idea in mind that I'm writing for the public in some fashion? I think I was just writing for more family and friends, because uh, actually when I started the blog, that's all who was you had subscribed but yeah i think i think just family friends um that, that's who i had in mind and obviously it grew to the point that i was writing for more of the public um but i guess i continued that um that thought that i was going to just write for, pe for people i knew interesting so the reason i asked that question is because uh larry why woody uh, uh well-known author who recently died, who I wanted to get on the program. I was trying to get him on the program. He died while I was in the process of trying to bring him on. Unfortunately, he came down with cancer. And he uh, he had written years ago that the proper way to write a novel is you have a single person in mind, and that's who you write it for. And uh, he did, during our email correspondence, confirm that he still believes that to this day, or to to his dying day anyway, he he believe that that was very much uh, the, the proper technique. Um, so that's why I asked that question, uh, just out of curiosity. Now, um, I do want our listeners to know a little bit about Bycatch here. I'm just going to read a little readout that, that uh, basically comes with the book. Rex Thompson has not spoken of the felony he committed in Vietnam for over two decades when his ne'er-do-well sons scuttle a shrimp boat in the Biloxi Bay and drown an immigrant fisherman who had witnessed this crime, Rex is flooded with remorse but remains silent. What else can you tell us about the book from there? Do you want to pick it up from there, Alex, and say uh, where the book goes without without uh, giving giving it away? Yeah, I think, um, I guess in that first uh, paragraph, I, I pull in the two main characters of the book, uh, Rex Thompson and... Um, uh, a Vietnamese uh, <clears throat> um, veteran um, by the name of uh, Captain Duong, and um, they they have a um, an incident where where Rex is uh, committing a felony uh, in Da Nang during the Vietnam War, and it, this felony is witnessed by uh, Captain Duong, who's South Vietnamese, and Rex was an American GI uh, a uh, staff sergeant in the Air Force, I uh, kind of had a, a menial job uh, in supply as a clerk. And um, and Captain Duong makes a decision that affects him for the rest of his life. He uh, can either march Rex down to the, uh, you know, to the special police and have him arrested, uh, or he can believe his story, which Rex had given, and um, look the other way. And um, he makes a decision that um, he ultimately regrets, but it never resolves. And uh, you know, during the war, and they they meet up again. Believe it or not, uh, you know, ten years later in Biloxi, where Biloxi had 
a large um, influx of Vietnamese uh, refugees, and a lot of them entered into the shrimping business. Uh, so all that is based on that. The story is based on that history of, of what would happen if these two Vietnam veterans, one American, one South Vietnamese, met up again and had to settle uh, an ongoing conflict. And uh, so that's kind of where the story begins. Um, and uh, now this shrimp boat that gets scuttled by Rex's adult son, so this is like 20 years later, um, <clears throat> forces the, the issue amongst the two families. Um, and so the majority of the book deals with <clears throat> how these two families, uh, Rex Thompson and his two sons, and the um, family of, of uh, Captain Dung, he goes by Don, Wan at this point, um, reconcile their lives and what had happened after the war. Um, so it's, a, it's a story of reconciliation, of um, guilt, uh, forgiveness, and um, um, it, it even kind of ends on kind of a biblical note, um, playing off of the word bycatch uh, in reference to the apostles uh, fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And um, so that, that's kind of the book in a nutshell. Without, Interesting. Now without, you were... Uh, Oh, go ahead. No, I said without giving away the, the, the um, you know, without giving away the, the spoils. Now, you were in the military. What branch were you in, and did you... Uh, Vietnam War was over by the time you were in, is that right? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, the war was over when I was in high school. Um, but it was, it was kind of my war. It was the war that kind of the first, you know, world um, event that I was aware of. I, I grew up you know, with the war and uh, new people who had, uh, you know, gone off to, to Vietnam. And and um, so I've always been interested in, in the Vietnamese, uh, in, in the Vietnam War. But no, I never served in it. I, I entered the um, military kind of during the middle of the Gulf, uh, um, Iranian Gulf uh, conflict. And uh, but I served as a hand surgeon in the Air Force for four years. So I really didn't, I didn't get to sleep in a tent or fly in an airplane, even shoot a weapon. So um, they, they kept me busy in the operating room. <laughs> hmm. You were doing hand surgery back in the military. Yes, yes. I, I, had, um, I had joined, I, at some point, the, uh, I had signed on a dotted line, and the Air Force paid for my education through medical school, and then... Um, uh, I thought they'd lost track of me for another six years, but they hadn't. And eventually, actually, I was living out in California at the time doing my hand fellowship. They sent me a letter saying that I had three choices. I could go to an Air Force base in California um, um, near um, uh, Fairfield um, or, um, or to one in Ohio or one in Mississippi. And I'd never been to Mississippi before. I didn't even know anything about <laughs> the South. Of course, that's where they sent me. And um, and I've been here ever since, since uh, 1991. And I wouldn't live anywhere else. It's a th where I live is a is a phenomenal place along the coast, uh, kind of halfway between New Orleans and Mobile. B Biloxi is a famous name. Biloxi, Mississippi, is a famous name. You're talking about a sure. state that really doesn't have very many f uh, cities that have that uh, are household names, but Biloxi is well known. Tell tell me about and you come from a coastal. Carmel, California, beautiful coastal yep. community. Now you're in a coastal community in Mississippi. You would think Carmel, California and Biloxi, Mississippi would have really nothing in common other than a waterfront. Uh, but maybe that's not the case. What t Tell us what's so compelling about Biloxi. Actually, uh, I actually live in Ocean Springs, which is real close to Biloxi across the, the bay. Mm. And it is actually a very, very much of a... It would have what Carmel was 40, 50 years ago. Um, and, you know, Carmel was kind of an artist community where a lot of, of people came to draw and write and have galleries, and, and um, uh, there was a tourist industry. Ocean Springs is very similar to that. It doesn't have the wealth that, that, uh, that Carmel does, but um, it's, 
it's got a very vibrant uh, artistic uh, and creative community um, in in Ocean Springs. So those things are very very similar. Um, Ocean Springs is a is a and Biloxi are very old uh, coastal towns that have a deep rich uh, history in uh, fishing and tourism. Believe it or not, just kind of like the California coast. So I, in a sense, I feel very very uh, at home here. Um, it's it, this area was a, a wonderful place to raise children. I, I raised four here. Um, and, uh, I think also, uh, you know, marrying a girl from Metairie, that's the, the town that, that she's from. That I couldn't Louisiana. pronounce, yes, Metairie. Okay. Louisiana. <laughs> uh, and, um, which is a suburb of New Orleans. Um, the, um, <clears throat> it, she, uh, has grounded me, you know, in the South and, and coming to the South, from after living in Chicago, I lived there for a decade and, um, and grew up in California. I, I think I offer a, a, or gain a different perspective of the culture and the people um, and the history than if I had grown up here. So I, I, I hope that I use that in, in my writing. Uh, I have a more of a, um, you know, a, in, in a sense, a, a journalistic uh, approach to to looking at um, the local culture here. So, are you um, a Southern writer, Alex? Do you consider yourself a Southern writer? I do now. I think I, I enjoy I enjoy Southern fiction. Um, I, I enjoy historical fiction, but I, I, I primarily read Southern fiction. Yeah, I would say I was, I was a Southern writer. Like, I, so name I, some authors. Are you a William Faulkner guy? Are you a James Lee Burke guy? Oh, um, Faulkner, I would love to be able to read and enjoy his, his prose, but I, but no, um, I, you know, my favorite authors right now are, um, uh, Michael Ferris Smith. Um, he is a Mississippi author, um, uh, Taylor Brown from, from uh, South Carolina, um, uh, Charles Frazier also from North Carolina. Um, it's, those are, um, Pat Conroy. Pardon me? Pat Conroy. Pat Conroy, yeah. Um, and but you know, I, I read a lot of other stuff too. I love biographies. I love um, to read history. Um, I, I I I hardly have time to read all the books that I want to to, to get into. So, but so I would what? consider my my style as um, more of a southern. It's not gothic. It's not southern gothic, but it's a. Uh, it's southern based, using southern themes of family and honor, um, and um, you know, forgiveness. Those are, 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 are themes that you often find in, in southern literature. So, and bycatch uh, is is based in Biloxi, Mississippi. You based it in a area where you live, and was absolutely. that was that because you you wanted to um, illustrate the culture, or was it because you knew the area well enough? that you felt like you could really um, tell it convincingly? Or I both? think, I think both. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, both. I, 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 you know, like we said, I had practiced here for, for um, almost 30 years and gotten to know a lot of, of um, characters that you might say are, that are in my book, both the, uh, uh, American uh, fishermen and uh, the newly arrived Vietnamese fishermen, and because um, a lot of them have had hand injuries that came, or other type of orthopedic injuries that that came to my attention, um, and and I wanted to tell their that story of the Vietnamese assimilation into the Biloxi fishing uh, industry. Um, you know the 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 famous. Uh, incidences were, you know, in um, the Galveston Bay, you know, where they they uh, had all sorts of uh, uh, problems with the Ku Klux Klan and and um, boats being burnt and uh, shots being fired and and people killed uh, during the same period of the early late seventies, early eighties, when the Vietnamese uh, after the uh, after the war were resettled uh, down there, and a lot of them took into fishing. Same thing happened a little bit in Biloxi, but the Biloxians were a lot more receptive to the Vietnamese coming in, and I don't know exactly why. Um, 
but they just really didn't have the tensions. There were some tensions, and that and that's some of the, of the issues that I bring up in the book. Um, but the, I believe there were more individual tensions. I, we didn't have the Ku Klux Klan coming down here and and, and marching against the Vietnamese uh, immigrants like they did in in Texas. Mm. Um, but it 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 was. It was all happening at, the, at that time. So it's that backdrop of the Vietnamese assimilating into the fishing, uh, shrimping industry that the book takes place. Um, and, um, of course, everything is pretty much fictional. Um, but it could have happened. Um, and uh, Or maybe it did happen. I just uh, wasn't reported. I don't know. Yeah, just about any, anything a person can write about has happened somewhere. Uh, it's, yeah. it's amazing how much of uh, fiction is is so rooted in in, uh, in in real life, it's it's almost not not fiction in in a sense. Um, so you have outlined the book, given the premise. If a person was thinking, you know, what what does uh, who does Alex Blevins um, really communicate like? What's his what's the nature of his prose? How would you describe, in fact, I should probably have you read a little bit of, uh, of the book, but how would you describe your prose? Um, I can serve uh, words. I, I'm not a real flowy um, a writer. Um, um, I, I, I try to steer away from real long sentences. Maybe I have a hard time just hanging on to the thought. Um, but... Um, I would say that I write in a very descriptive fashion as far as the uh, environment and the scene that I'm, I'm describing. I like to write dialogue, um, and um, that just fascinates me, um, I guess because I, I see it in my head. I see the scene playing out, and and the, the actors, or the actors, the, the characters, um, you know, arguing with each other or... or or you know, trying to to get their point across uh, using uh, whatever vernacular they, they have or, or dialect, and um, so uh, I I tend to to sometimes go heavy on the on the dialogue and not so much on the on the prose. But when I do do prose, it's more descriptive. I, I wouldn't say I'm a real touchy feely type of a writer, but uh, I try to get that across in the storyline and the dialogue. Yeah, you know, in the notes I have here, you say that the uh, the book idea started out as a what if. What if two shrimpers, both Vietnamese veterans, run into each other decades after the war and need to settle a conflict? One is a U.S. veteran, the other is South Vietnamese. Um, just an interesting premise right there, that, that, whole, that whole setup. Do you, uh, could you read a little bit of the book for us, Alex? I should, have sure. me- I should have mentioned this ahead of time. I didn't warn you that I'd ask you that, that but if you can read some uh, portion of it, a, a few minutes of it, that's emblematic of, of maybe the tone of the book. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start um, with uh, the first a few paragraphs of the first chapter. Uh, and uh, um, mainly because I've read it, that chapter so many times, I can almost <laughs> cite it by memory. But uh, <laughs> let me, um, this won't give away anything, it's the very first chapter. So chapter one, Biloxi, Mississippi, August 16th, 1993. Wooden blades slapped the dark, still water, pulling a flat-bottomed skiff across the Biloxi Bay. Jake crouched low at the bow and trained his eyes on the lone white light ahead. His younger brother, Pigeon, worked the oars. Both were in their early 20s, lean and muscular. A single black skimmer glided over the water, beating its wings past the boat through the summer's thick, humid air. No moon or stars filled the midnight sky, just as the brothers had hoped. They had a task to do, a score to settle. At the far end of the bay, 600 yards off Deer Island, a trawler rested at anchor. From its boom, a bright halogen beam lit up huge nets hanging from outriggers on either side of the vessel. With 42 feet at the waterline, she had the classic, graceful lines of a Gulf Coast shrimper. Across the transom and bow, the name Miss Ahn arced in newly gilded letters. Her gold name board, green pilot house, and red hull presented a semblance 
of Christmas. Jake felt the gentle vibration of an electric generator as he grabbed the trawler's anchor line to steady the skiff. Without a sound, Pigeon stowed the oars and pulled on heavy knit gloves. He dragged a canvas sack from beneath his seat and gave it to Jake. Sweat beaded on Pigeon's brow and ran <clears throat> into the corners of his eyes. He eased himself over the skiff's gunwale and into the warm bay. Jake pulled a length of cable, looped at each end out of the sack. Holding on to one end of the coil, he handed the remainder over the side. For a moment, the heavy wire dragged Pigeon's head underwater. Give me that float, Pigeon mouthed as he struggled at the surface. Jake tossed a square white seat cushion to his brother. Pigeon trapped the pad under his arm and played out the cable with one hand as he sidekicked along the hull the missed eye. At the stern, he grabbed a tire bumper hanging from the back rail to rest a moment. Looking up to the tra transom in the newly gilded letters, he mumbled, Those bastards. Then he took a deep breath, released the cushion, and sank into the inky water. I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Talk about your writing routine. How do you produce your copy? Is Are you a morning guy? Are you an all-day, you know, uh, in uh kind of catching some writing time in snatches? Do you do you stay up and burn the midnight oil? Oh, I can't stay up. <laughs> Nine o'clock is the witching hour. I usually fall asleep. I, I, I often get up early, and um, I, I seem to have a clear head at that point and write um, sometimes for two hours, sometimes for three, four hours. Occasionally, when I'm I have the time and the opportunity, and um, I I can go all day, and um, and I think that that's when the majority of my first drafts are written in kind of uh, spurts like that, where I just kind of get into the into the zone and and can't wait for the next chapter to start so I can see what is going to happen. Um, once the first draft is done, the the revisions and the editing I tend to do in more shorter uh, intervals, you know, two hours at a time, and primarily in the morning as well. So, um, How did you know but, when to stop? How did you know when it was time to, like, mail it to an agent? Um, I guess when I started putting back the commas that I just had taken out. <laughs> <laughs> um you know that is a that is I'm sure you asked this question of a lot of authors and and uh, it is um, it's almost an impossible time it's almost impossible for me to to, to know that um, I guess I just got tired of it I got tired of the book um, I felt that the changes that I were making um, were not adding anything to the story. Um, I tried to make it a little longer and then I pulled that the uh, uh, copy out because it, it it just didn't fit and and uh, and I guess I guess you just get tired of it you know and uh, um, you just like to see see this move on and, and get on with another pro, uh, project and, and so um, I think yeah, that's, that's the case with a lot of people I think they just get tired of it and they want to get it off their desk or off their hard drive and they and they move forward with it I and, tend to be a, a careful first draft writer. I write on the computer. Um, I tend to to read what I wrote, you know, the previous day, and think about it, and write and correct, you know, at the same time. So, I, I'm, I'm not a not somebody who just has to get it down on paper and uh, then go back and do a lot of editing. Um, so, I, I, I tend to write fairly carefully. But I'm also a pantser. I have seat of the pants uh, uh, writer. I don't. I. I have a general idea of what the plot's going to be, and but uh, most of the time I come up with a situation like I did with Bycatch, where I have these two fishermen who are Viet, Viet, Vietnam veterans who come together and have to settle this score, and and I let the the characters solve the the issue, and. Um, I often really don't know the characters well enough at the beginning of the book to really know how they're going to solve this issue, you know, and um, so they, they surprise me a, a lot. In fact, one time I was writing before lunch, and um, 
my two characters who I just read about, Jake and, and Pigeon, who are the sons of Rex, adult sons, um, they're, um, they're not really good people. And uh, they're very low class. They just started swearing up a storm in my book. And I wasn't prepared for that. I, I, I don't normally use that kind of language, although I've heard it and I know it and I don't even know how to write it. But um, it, uh, it really surprised me. <laughs> and bothered me actually for a long time because uh, uh, I didn't know really what, know what to do with it. And uh, you know, should I keep it or should I edit it out? And uh, finally, uh, after giving it much thought and talking to folks, I, I said, "Well, you know, these are the these are they these are the they're they're their own characters, and this is how they would talk." And 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 so I left it in, but. Um, so it's kind of organic. They, the characters took on a life and a voice of their own, and you and you went with it. I yeah, I found it and 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 just revealed it basically. And, and I guess these these characters are, are people that I have known. And and uh, uh, like I said in my in my practice, I came across and, and interacted with a lot of, of people who live a, who led a different life than I did. Who who had uh, you know hard scrapple lives on shrimp boats and on the in the uh, shipyards and um um so i i i was exposed to a lot of people that had a different uh background than myself you know you joined writers groups writing groups and uh, i've been critical of writing groups for for several reasons but um what happened when you were reading some of your copy in there for instance if you started uh went into a swearing fit did they did you get any any um, advice from them just in terms of, hey, that's fine, They're, this is real life, that's the way people talk uh, from that particular, you know, depending on their culture, their education, and so on, their upbringing? Um, what, what did writing groups do for you on balance? Were they positive? Were they, did, did they have you going in circles to some degree? Um, no, I don't, you know, I've, I'm, I've been a member, or I'm a member of two writing groups, and I would consider everybody in those groups to be my friends and they're they're frankly honest with their critique um and um and they're, they're they, i i'm really i've been blessed that they have that i haven't and i've been in a group that has been you know trying to change the way i write um and uh so no i don't they they did not did not uh, try to, to to change that now in my latest book, uh, Arkansas Black, um, the uh, I, I used a lot of, of di dialect that um, I think I, I read uh, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath kind of as I was preparing to write this, just to kind of see how people talked in the 1930s in Arkansas and, and Oklahoma. And uh, so I, I used a lot of his um, <clears throat> uh, dialect and... Um, I did get some pushback on that to to, uh, uh, to, to tone that down and make it a little bit more readable. And uh, I, I don't know. I think that's more of just a, a more modern way to to, to write. But um, how many people are in your writing group? Oh, uh, six or seven on each. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, wh why two groups? Is it just that you wanted to meet more often with people, or are they uh, kind of a different different flavor or for, for a different purpose? One group is very focused on novel writing. Everybody is working on a novel, and uh, some are published novelists, and, and some are wannabe published novelists. Uh, the other group... It has more of just have a creative writing bent to it. There, there's some poets um, in the in the group. Um, there are those who just like to write short stories or journal and um, or um, and, and 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 sometimes and some of them have actually written written some novels too. But it, it the flavor of the two groups is is very different. I joined one before I joined the other, and because I think I was looking for a group that had a little bit more uh, of a novelist perspective, and so that's why I joined the other one. I, and uh, but I enjoy both groups; they're all my friends. So, um, and I fortunately have time to be able to to interact with them. So. Now you have traveled the United States in a uh, uh, a um, airstream. 
trailer? Sure. A couple times. A couple <laughs> times. What did you <laughs> learn about your country and doing that? Or what was your takeaway with all those travels? Oh, boy, I don't know if I've ever asked that, been asked that question. Um, <clears throat> so much of travel, I mean, I, I just think that travel ends up in so many books, and and there's so much that we, oftentimes we meet a lot of characters on the road as well. We sure do. We sure do. Um, the, um, you know, and, and, when, and when you're camping, we, we have this, this Airstream travel trailer that we drag around. Um, you get to know people in a different ma manner than you would if you stayed in hotels. Um, mainly because you're outside, you're in a campground, people next door are also traveling, or they may be locals. And, and, and so, um, I think I, that's one of the things I enjoy about, about camping is, is, uh, of course I used to do a lot of tent camping, but now that I'm older and my wife doesn't like to do that anymore, <laughs> that's why we, we trailer. But, um, you know, some of the things that, that did, always blow me away every time i drive from mississippi to colorado is how much open space there is in the in the country um how vast it is and how many people live so remotely you know away from the coast and um and and their their perspective on, on life is so different um and uh which is very refreshing and i've always lived in kind of not cosmopolitan, or uh, well, I would say cosmopolitan, not metropolitan areas. I lived on the California coast, and I lived in the, the coast of uh, Lake Michigan, you might say, in Chicago, and uh, now here on the Gulf Coast. But when you get in the middle of the country, um, you find you definitely find a different flavor amongst amongst people. And uh, one time we were in uh, Arkansas and uh, noticed that our our Kansans uh, are, are always very, very friendly. You'd be driving down the road, and they would stop their lawnmower and wave at you like you were their best friend. And, and um, my wife and I were, were really quite taken back by this. And and uh, one time we were drag, driving driving along with our trailer in tow, and this man pulls up kind of next to us with his pickup truck, and he was just waving at us and waving at us, and we waved on back. And, and we thought, how friendly these guys were, you know? It was only later on that after we got to our campsite that we realized that we had blown a tire on our airstream and, and i didn't notice it because we have four tires and uh, he was trying to, he wasn't he was trying he was friendly but he's trying to trying to motion to us or yeah. signal to us that we had a problem friendly <laughs> enough to alert you to a problem that's <laughs> that's a good thing we, we just thought he was being friendly like all the arkansans were but um but we've enjoyed we've enjoyed uh uh getting out and uh, and seeing the country uh, with that. Um, now, you're also a hiker. You've hiked in Spain and in Patagonia. Yes. Um, what did you learn about, uh, you know, getting around on two feet in foreign countries? Are there any observations you would bring back from that? Um, well, both those trips were very different um, in Patagonia. It was a chilly part of Patagonia. We went down to Torres de Paine and uh, hiked a fairly famous trail. It's, it's, uh, it's called the W. Um, it, it, it goes through some absolutely gorgeous uh, glacier areas and mountains and, and, and glacial lakes. Um, we had we had booked a, a guide with that trip um, just because it, it was you know we were going to. The other end of the world, and I kind of didn't know much about hiking in that area. Um, that trip was very different than when we went to um, to Spain to uh, Galicia and hiked uh, along the uh, uh, the Camino de Santiago, which is the um, pilgrim way towards the city of Santiago, which is um, um, a destination has been a Christian destination for the last thousand years, and it's it's a fascinating trail. Um, you weren't we weren't nearly as remote, um, and uh, most people spoke English, and and uh, and then if you if you did break down and and couldn't go another step, there was always Uber you could <laughs> you could take to the next town. But uh, um, 
that was a that was a, a trip of a lifetime just hiking that and a lot of people do it for spiritual reasons and and, and i think that we probably my wife and i probably did but i would say about a third of the people on that trail were doing it just to to hike a long trail that was relatively safe in a, in a beautiful part of the country and the surprising thing about that part of spain is having grown up in northern california you you couldn't tell the difference between Napa Valley and and that part of Spain um, with the vineyards and the, and the uh, little towns and it was just it, it was uncanny how similar the, uh, the, the those two areas were. Interesting. Um, I want to get back to Arkansas Black. Um, it's I find it. I mean, it's a big. It's a big challenge that you're taking on. You're, you're writing something that you want to serve as a prequel to Grapes of Wrath. Um, talk a little bit about where the idea came from. I, I suspect you're a, a Steinbeck fan to begin with. That period of, uh, in history is of interest to you. But um, in what way will it be a prequel? Well, it, it's, it's, not, it's not an actual prequel to the Grapes of Wrath. Um, it... Uh, but it, it takes place several years or a few years before uh, the Grapes of Wrath takes place, before the Dust Bowl, and um, in, an, in an area that is very, very similar to where Jode and, and the rest of his clan uh, set off from Arkansas, from uh, Oklahoma. Um, in, in a sense, it is, it's, it's a prequel in the sense that it's, what happened in Arkansas several years before what happened in um, Oklahoma was was basically the same. They, this part of Ar- of Arkansas, where actually where um, Walmart is headquartered in Bentonville, Arkansas, at one point those two counties in Northwest Arkansas were the the largest apple producing counties in the country. Actually, some of the largest a- apple producing orchards in the world um, for. Uh, uh, apples, and uh, they would put them on trains and send them down to New Orleans and ship them around the world. That started about the turn of the century, 1900, and went on for about two decades. And then by the middle middle of 1920s, the entire industry just collapsed um, for a number of reasons. And uh, one of one reason was was the introduction of disease and, and pests that they had a, a no effective control over it. Uh, they also had some really bad years from a uh, weather standpoint, um, not to mention the flood of 1927, the uh, Mississippi River. But uh, in addition to that, the, the apple industry in uh, Washington State was taking off uh, because they built some dams, they had cheap irrigation, they had lots of sunlight, and they had the development of refrigerated cars. So they could ship these apples anywhere in the country much cheaper than they southerners could so um this whole industry just started collapsing and you know orchards were going bankrupt and and people were moving starting to move out uh then and they uh back to to the west coast and to the east coast and and some actually were able to kind of shift gears and go into chickens uh, which is one of the big industries up there right now but um my um, my family actually was affected by that. My family at the time, uh, my grandfather was born in uh, Benton County, and he left about that time. So it's kind of a family story, a kind of family history uh, that that I that most people just don't know. They don't know that story that before the before the Dust Bowl, this whole area of uh, the Springfield uh, Plain uh, was was being decimated uh, because of of uh, loss of the apple industry. Yeah, I, so- knew, I knew nothing of it. That's news to me. In- interesting that, that that just kind of, I mean, there's there's been so many stories uh, in, in our nation's history. Uh, so many of these things just kind of as, uh, escape us. But you're going to chronicle it in a, you know, Historically accurate, but but fictionalized version. Would you say that uh, historically accurate? Absolutely, yeah. Historically accurate um, and fictionalized. Yes, and and, and that the story re- is, revolves um, around two brothers who are actually identical twins, 
who are losing their orchard to bankruptcy and um they have an alcoholic father and and uh these two brothers are actually married to two sisters um who came from a, a more well-to-do family than, than they did and as the um as they're losing the, the orchard they they both have different ideas as, as to what to do i mean one, one brother is a sensible one and he wants to just pack up and and like grapes of wrath and and, and you know um put a flatbed on the back of the model t uh, ford and, and drive as far west as he can go and the other brother uh is uh never wants to leave the land and uh you know it's he's, he's gonna it's gonna be the, the the land that he dies on and his bones are going to be buried there and, and nobody's taking his uh you know uh, his property and uh it's his family property heirloom property and uh so of course you know you need to throw in a few family secrets and some conflicts and some twists and turns and stuff but that's basically the story and how they resolve that and you you soon learn that these these brothers they can't live together, uh, but they really can't live apart either, um, being identical twins. And um, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. One of the things that um, I kind of lit up to is you've got uh, these two characters, two primary characters in Bycatch, and Arkansas Black. You're talking about two brothers. Do you pay attention to? I mean, is 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 one of the things you strive to do? is to limit the number of characters and create a maybe maybe a two person dynamic works particularly well for what you're trying to do so limiting the number of characters make it um, easily tracked by the reader and create that 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 yin yang dynamic or am i reading too much into this maybe reading too much into it i, <laughs> I tend I, to do um, that <laughs> no arkansas arkansas black yeah, definitely has two main characters, and uh, and 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 they're and they're two two families. So that is that I, I, be, I believe that I did that maybe to to really develop you know the the relationship between the two characters. In By Catch, there are two characters that start off in the book, and but um, one of the characters dies in the, in the very first chapter. So um, it's it uh ah, okay. it is um it's really two families that that have to deal with that and um yeah i, I do try to keep the, the number of characters um uh to it to a minimum because i i find that when i read books and especially when i read when the characters have similar names and are not well described and or, or visualized in my head i often get those <laughs> mixed up yeah, I, I maybe, I'm a, same, maybe I'm a simple person. I don't know. Oh, I'm the, I'm the same way. It's a I, I like a clean story with a, a you know fairly limited number of characters. It's always easy to track that way, and and also just the development of the characters can be richer if it's if there there's not so many of them that you're that the author has to you know divide his or her time so much between them. And of course, space is limited too. People tend to not want to write. You know, too many words. I make the. Uh, it's intimidating these days, uh, particularly when people are into more short form reading. I mean, your your book weighs in at what? How many pages? Oh, it's uh, two hundred and thirty pages. Yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty compact story. What what else should people know about Alexander Blevins? That's that's the, the your author name that's on the book, Alexander Blevins. Uh, anything else that you would tell the audience that um, uh, they should know about you or your writing? Um, well, my friends call me Alex. Uh, only my mother called me Alexander, and then only when she had a wooden spoon in her hand. Um, <laughs> my mom had that same wooden spoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, but you know, I I I retired relatively early from a career in, in orthopedics, and one of the main drivers of my early retirement was. I wanted to be, I didn't want to just be Dr. Blevins. Um, I wanted to be something else to, to my family, to my friends, and to myself. Uh, and, um, um, and so writing has allowed me to do that. Um, it's allowed me to, 
to explore, you know, my, my thoughts. It's uh, allowed me to meet new people and, and learn new skills. And um, I would encourage anybody to, you know, if they, if they have that inkling to, to be a storyteller, uh, to, to pick up fiction and just and, and write for other people, you know, not, not write for themselves, but write for other people. That's, that worked for me. One thing I do want to say, and, and I need to clarify this, is that the obviously the working title of my my new book is uh, Arkansas Black. It Arkansas Black is a variety of a tree, uh, apple tree, and, uh, and so that's where the name comes from. And uh, I liked it because the it, it it centers the story in Arkansas, which it does. It, the whole story takes place within a couple months. And uh, I think the the name Arkansas Black kind of gives a sinister, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, feeling to it, which which the story does. So it's a great name. Yeah, yeah it's a, you know it's compact and it it uh, definitely is uh, full of potential meaning. So and I didn't know that that it, that that's the name of a of a of a uh, breed of apple tree as well. Yeah, it's, a, it's an apple variety, like you know, Golden Delicious or Pippin or, or you know. Honey crisp, but but uh, Arkansas Black is a, a southern uh, apple variety that is hardly ever grown anymore. Actually, they grow more Arkansas Blacks in California and in, in, in uh, Central California they do in Arkansas now. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> so our guest has been Alexander Blevins. That's how it appears on the book. Alex to his friends. Uh, By catch is the name of the novel. It's a, it's a story soaked with greed and forgiveness. Well, Southern and Vietnamese cultures tangle on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, very interesting to, to hear from you, Alex. Thank you for taking the time and coming on the program. I appreciate that, Mike, for having me. And uh, it was wonderful talking to you.